All right, how's everyone doing? Good. 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 All right, well, let's get started. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about your companies? So I co-founded Fireside with Mark Cuban, and we work with celebrity-led media companies and brands, and we help them solve two problems. We help them grow their owned audience, because so much of their fan base today lives on platforms they don't own, like social or faceless listeners on their podcasts. So we help them really own that relationship with their audience and as a part of that own their, that first party data. The second problem we help them solve is to uh, deepen their relationship with their fans by launching interactive video community offerings. So for example, Steve Harvey, who's a partner of ours, he's launched the Steve Harvey Network, uh, which is the interactive motivational network to help you elevate your life. And he does uh, coaching and mentorship with his members. Last week he had Dr. Phil on, his daughter hosts an interactive book club on it, um, and his members you know, pay for that level of access and get to connect with him on a uh, weekly and monthly basis. That's awesome. Um, so I co-founded Recurrent Ventures. We acquire great brands and build the audiences around them. We, sp we focus on specific content verticals like home, where we own brands like Dwell, Domino, BobViola.com. Uh, Auto, where we own Donut, the biggest YouTube channel, and the number one and number two podcast about cars. Uh, we have a defense vertical, and then we have an outdoor and science vertical where we own brands like Popular Science uh, and Outdoor Life. And what we do is we find the audience wherever they are, whether it's on social or, or on the web. So I have my own boutique media company. It's called Go Like. As I mentioned, I started out at Univision in Spanish language national media, then went on to NBC for English language national media. And it was the beginning of the pandemic where my contract was up and NBC's like, we want to extend you for another four years. And it just dawned on me, of course, we all know what was happening 2020. I was like, I am aboard the Titanic and it's sinking. <laughs> so I left that contract on the table and they were like, are you going to go to CNN or the competition? And I'm like, no, I just don't think this model works anymore. It's become incredibly divisive and politicized. And you know, in journalism, there's always this idea that if, if you're a journalist, then you can't do any corporate work. And I started realizing because of a TEDx talk that I had given that went viral that a lot of companies were coming to me saying, can you inspire our workforce? that there was uh, an opportunity to really change hearts and minds and inspire people in corporate, and that that optimism didn't necessarily exist in the network news model anymore. So my company essentially focuses on two things, which are bespoke journalism projects, where I reach my audience, whether it be a bilingual podcast where I'm on the field, or you know a social media video series, and then these big corporate events where I'm front facing, and the through line is always that authenticity that I bring to my brand. Awesome. Well, Fallon, you wrote an article about community engagement, the future of community engagement as it pertains to technology. Um, can you talk a little bit about how the idea of fandom is shifting and the relationship between fans and talent? Yeah, so this is a, an area that we kind of call the community economy versus the kind of creator economy. And it's really about, uh, instead of chasing likes and views, focusing on your super fans. The super yeah. fans are um, you know, the, the people that really are willing to spend 80% more than the average person and really buy into a brand, buy into you know, everything that a particular you know, celebrity or um, a specific kind of organization does. Um, and so what we are seeing with our partners that we work with is um, you, know, you can make up to 400 times more per view by engaging with your super fans and particularly with a subscription model than you do, could on, uh, let's say, YouTube. On YouTube, it takes at least like five and a half million views to make about $100,000, which is a lot. Of, that doesn't even count the amount of time and effort and cost that you put in to even create that content. Um, and so, you know, with that, we think there's a big opportunity to kind of change the overall. Uh, you know, value system of the media and entertainment space and really start to focus more on the fans and followers around the IP that you create versus just focusing on monetizing that IP. And a great example of that is if you look at the success of Rihanna with Fenty. I mean, that is an incredible example of someone who has, you know, just obviously an icon, a household name, but has now built so many different businesses and her 
her fans that were fans of her music are now fans of her being a parent, follow her in terms of her um, makeup brand and now her clothing brand. I mean, she's unstoppable. Um, and we also saw that with the Taylor Swift effect with the NFL, where just by her dating someone, the NFL overnight was able to reach an audience that they have been desperate to reach for decades. So um, there's a real opportunity by harnessing those super fans, and you don't have to even be that big of an icon to really kind of become the media companies of the future. Andrew, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, so I would echo that experience with three of our brands. So with Donut, our YouTube car channel, we do about 40 million streams per month, uh, which equals almost half a billion minutes a month streamed. But if you look at that, that's almost like the top of the funnel, and there are 40,000 people that bought our merch, and that spend is multiples of the revenue that we generate off of YouTube. Um, another great example is we own Outdoor Life. It's a 150-year-old outdoor media business, and we recently launched a line of merch, um, actually a bespoke line of hunting knives that we licensed out, and the spend behind those products is many multiples of what we'll generate off of the advertising. So I completely echo the point about finding the super fan. Yeah. And in my case, I would say, as a creator, is truly understanding like who that super fan is, right? For me, I know it's probably a person who is bilingual, who loves to see me sort of, you know, move into the Spanish, English, Spanglish world, and how can I create something for that person that, you know, they're truly gonna feel acknowledged by in the experience. And an example of that is my true crime investigative podcast series. So. I could have done any podcast about any subject, but I found this case of two women who went missing in the jungle in Central America, and I had the opportunity, I love, I'm known for my field journalism, so getting really like in there, um, and I had the opportunity to go to this trail where they went missing on the anniversary of their disappearance. My community like followed me there from this very rich then listening experience that was like happening in Spanish, but then I narrated in English, and it's seven episodes called Lost in Panama. I'm not gonna tell you what happened. <laughs> All you have to know is that I spent a month living in the jungle, but that's the sweet spot. You know, it's not just a podcast of me just sitting on a chair talking. Right. It's something that's specifically gonna talk to the super fan. So cool. Yeah. So Mariana, you're part of a, an industry where the the creator and fan relationship has traditionally been one directional, right? You've had, the, had people talking to their fans, but you haven't had that back and forth interaction. Um, why do you see that, that shift towards maybe audience ownership is becoming so critical to your space? It is fundamental because it's almost like you are almost co-creating the content. You know, your fans, your community, and I don't even like, like that we call them fans. You know, they're, they're your community. You're kind of in it together. They need to feel some sense of ownership. You guys remember that movie Inception, the Leonardo DiCaprio yeah. movie? So you need to make them almost think or know that the idea came from them and this is something that you're co-creating together. And they will fight tooth and nail for that because they feel that there's skin in the game for them. Yeah, and how much do you want to get involved, I guess, in the fan relationships that you have? I mean, there's, there's a lot of ways that could go awry, but a lot of ways that could also benefit your business. Listen, it, it's, it's like field journalism, right? You can't just talk the talk, you have to walk the walk. And now it's just that as easy as seeing kind of what, what they're into, the criticism, take feedback well. I mean, there was a point, especially doing reporting at a place like NBC, where, yeah, you will get some hate comments, like, why'd you say that? Like, I didn't like the story today. But if they're said respect, if, respectfully, you have to acknowledge them and say, like, wait a minute, what can I learn from this to kind of make the relationship stronger and better? And Andrew and Fallon, in your business, you're seeing and working with a lot of different types of creators, some of whom are probably used to an ownership-driven model, some of whom are not. Um, how do you help your creators think about their relationship with their fans and how that's evolving? So for us, we obviously look at the commenting and engage yeah. with the commenting, but I think the biggest trend that we're seeing is that people actually want to live the brand and actually do things that are experiential. And so for us, live is taking a very different format. So for instance, right, we own Dwell, Dwell is known for the house tour. If you go to the website, that's what it's about. Later this year, we will do house tours in six cities of things that have actually been in the publication. Uh, when it comes to Donut, our car brand, we actually had the fastest selling live event in the, in the history of the Peterson Museum in LA, which is probably the best car museum in the country at this point. Sold it out, streets were closed because the LAPD had to come in because it was so swamped. Um, and that was just, the fans wanted to hang out with these guys, right? I mean, this is like boy band level fandom for a car YouTube channel. 
and you know that kind of engagement where people want to see it, touch it, um, be inside the the content is really what we're seeing, and one of the things that we're excited about as we go through the year. I mean, in terms of what we do, everything is centered around interactivity and specifically with video. So the impact of that we see for our partners um, is really on their kind of consumer journey where they're able to deepen their relationship with someone who might have just read a book, uh, you know, maybe taken a course if they're like a, like for example, we have the FBI hostage negotiator, Chris Voss, uh, who wrote the top negotiation book in the world. He has a network where he coaches people on negotiation. And it, you can get coached by him, you can get coached by his eight different coaches. And whatever situation you have, they're gonna actually work with you on a weekly basis and coaching you through that. Um, and uh, you know, pe most people might have discovered him through reading his book or taking his masterclass on the platform masterclass. It's pretty popular on that. Um, and then from there, it's now they can deepen their understanding of his curriculum by taking those learnings and now being able to personalize it to their day to day. The impact of that for our partners is it actually helps them grow all their other business product lines as well. Because now they're helping take someone who might have had a um, uh, you know, le less deep relationship with them to start, and now they're really building a deeper relationship with them to then introduce them to kind of the next step of the journey of their business, which for him might be taking a workshop or going to a live event or maybe getting some private one-on-one -on -one coaching. Um, and so we're seeing that impact across the board uh, in terms of making their other products much more successful as well. This is not dissimilar to, um, you know, like someone like a Ryan Reynolds who, um, you know, has been successful across multiple different businesses uh, from Wrexham, uh, his uh, you know, football, not the American one, <laughs> league, um, to, um, I think now they're getting into the F1 and, and car space as well, um, to his gym. Um, and all of that really showcases sort of the power of the fandom, but he engages with his fans all the time. Um, and so I think that's a, it's a pretty critical aspect of I think the future of everything is going, um, and I definitely see it being very fan driven. Andrew, you come from a space where um, there's been a historical precedent around print media ownership, uh, moving into the digital space, and now being dominated by video. How do you see the interplay between the different mediums uh, shifting and changing as fan and creator ownership changes? So the biggest trend that we're seeing is obviously a trend towards video. And the reason why, in my view, we're seeing it is one, that content is less expensive to create than it ever was. It can be created just at a moment, right? We can do it from our iPhone right now and post it the next minute. And as a result, you're seeing the consumer demand for that. In my view, what video allows you to do that text-based media never has is it makes you feel like you know the people in it. And one of the things that I've found the most interesting is if you go to YouTube and you look at Cybertruck reviews, the guys that are the creators are getting more reviews than the professional brands. Like Marcus Brownlee, who's one of the biggest product reviewers on YouTube, um, if you look at his Cybertruck review, more views than the Motor Trend review. And people want that authenticity, and I think that's a byproduct of what's happened in video. Text-based media still has a critical place because people like to read things, um, if, there, if it's more in-depth, right? So in our military vertical, that is more of a text-based media uh, vertical for us, but each one has a separate place. And you know, for Dwell, we still do print, which is pretty wild. Like we have a very healthy print business and our advertising in print is actually up 15% year over year. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Because people, when they're doing their houses, they wanna be able to walk around with this beautiful magazine and get inspiration for what they're gonna do to their home. So I think, all of these different things have a place based on the consumer end use, and you just have to understand what the intersection is between your brand and what the customer wants to use it for. Yeah, what do you think, Maya? I would say um, definitely video. Video has always been my forte, so I will always gravitate yeah. toward that, and I agree with you. I mean, we have uh, a ring light set up backstage, and I'm literally getting interviewees of, as they're coming off this panel with a microphone, and that's something that I would have required three people, right, maybe five years ago. Um, I, I do see a return to certain like, certain like old school things like newsletters, for example, like people wanting to get those emails, but that also offer kind of this very personalized experience. So I am seeing a trend toward that. And then I'm just blown away with this podcast, which is the first that I've ever done, about how intimate the audio experience is and how that has been a way to connect with my fans and my community 
so much more intimately without kind of like the in-your-face video. So that has been pretty amazing to me, and it's something that I'll continue to explore. John? So we see double the amount of so we on our platform you can use audio. Most people, I mean, 99%, it's all video, um, and we see double the amount of engagement where video is involved with audiences versus with audio. Um, so I think there's definitely like from a podcasting perspective that there's a consumer habit around that, and I think there's a there's a level of intimacy around that too. But when it when it comes to two-way interaction, video is absolutely more intimate. And there's something about it being actually less produced yes. and it feeling like a, almost like a, an interactive FaceTime that creates this level of intimacy, intimacy between the audience and you know, whoever is on the virtual stage um, that we actually see also showing through in terms of retention numbers. Um, so, I mean, for, for this kind of a interactive offering with video, we're seeing about like 70% of uh, people are opting for an annual membership versus a monthly one, and then the retention, like they stay on um, and they're highly engaged, which is very unique for what you would normally think of a digital subscription. So if the iPhone cut the cost of production down by an order of magnitude, I imagine AI is gonna do the same in a lot of domains. Um, so Fallon's question for you, since you you're come from the AI space, how do you see AI changing the media and entertainment landscape? Um, yeah, so my last company was an AI company and you know, predating a lot of the, the sort of chat GPT and LLM side of things. Um, in terms of how AI is gonna impact media and entertainment, I mean, we already use it on a day-to-day -day basis just internally at my company. We use it for research, we use it for um, metadata generation, uh, we use it for newsletters, we use it to help create copy. Um, so we're already using chat GPT in so many different ways. Um, I'd say where I think it's going to be really compelling from a broader media and entertainment perspective is being able to um, take great ideas that creatives have and have now a co-pilot that can be trained on the data set, whether it's a, you know, a screenwriter, on like the actual way in which they write their plots of their shows or series and be able to leverage that to do you know, a lot of the work kind of upfront, draft maybe the initial draft, and then from there be able to really dig in and focus on the higher value um, aspects of that creative creation. Um, I don't think talking to a lot of media executives in the space that the um, AI, you know, like this, I think the model is called Sor Sorare or whatever, Sora. Sora. Um, yeah, I don't, we don't, I don't think it's there yet in terms of being able to create a like high, you know, fully generated AI, you know, blockbuster movie. Um, but in terms of doing a lot of the legwork around it, um, I think there's a big opportunity there just to make the industry overall more efficient. Um, but the ideas still come from the people. Um, and I think that's where, you know, when there was a strike, there was a lot of fear around this kind of technology taking jobs. And I think some jobs will become less necessary. But really, I think with the opportunity that it presents is, is really having people work in more strategic roles from a creative perspective a co with a co-pilot assisting them to be more efficient. Yeah, wouldn't like to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I would echo that statement. I think we're already at the place where we're, I guess what I would say is we're at the infancy stage of AI as the co-pilot. I think that's a very good way to put it, which um, for us, we do things like we generate thumbnails using AI. So the little thumbnails you see on an Instagram or a YouTube for any of our brands, many of those are tested and generated through AI. We are a long way away from going beyond that. I mean, I will tell you from testing 15 different products, we're not even at the place where uh, AI with any level of reliability can take an article and turn it into a 15 second video, much less come up with a full story that's any good. Um, I don't think AI could come up with surviving the jungles of Panama, right? So like real human experiences, I think will always trump what AI does. I do think the place where AI is gonna be the most disruptive to digital media is what's gonna happen with search. And we're right at the beginning of that, right? With Google's search generative experience, you actually see the search results already changing as Google rolls that out. And so what's gonna happen as a result of that is a huge amount of disruption with brands based on what people are looking for. Yeah. And I agree with you, Fallon, that you know, it's not that AI is going to replace storytelling, it's just that what all of us do, you have to know your audience so well and the high value that you add to really make AI enhance what it is that you do. And I think that's where storytelling, and I'm a storyteller through and through, 
becomes critical because if you look at you know just humanity in general, we've always been telling stories, right? So from you know the caves, from the clay tablets of Mesopotamia to the latest prompt on ChatGPT, we will continue to do that, and that will continue to tell our collective history as human beings. But the power of that message has to come, you know, from from just very core of authenticity and knowing who you're speaking to. So for someone who's thinking about getting into the media entertainment space today, what would you advise them to do in terms of thinking about how AI is going to impact them and how to take advantage of it? Ooh. Well, so one thing that we didn't talk about in terms of AI is the power of the training sets, because really the AI is only as good as the actual like data it's trained on. And I think that presents really interesting and complex challenges for IP owners, where um, you know even between YouTube and OpenAI, there is a big conflict around how oh, has ChatGPT been using YouTube videos as training data? And now the creator community is kind of up in arms. Well, that's my IP. Yeah. And I'm distributing it on YouTube, but I don't give permission for companies to be trading on that that information. That's my that's my kind of core business. It's my core asset. So I think there's really interesting challenges around that. But I think protecting your IP is a really important thing to be looking at and evaluating, making sure your terms of service, if your information is publicly accessible and your advertising business model is also protecting you from that. Um, and that's really, I think, going to be the core differentiator for being able to leverage AI down the line when it is good enough to be able to take articles and generate videos and summarize things. So outside of AI, what are you most excited about in the entertainment space 10 years out? I'm really excited about, you know, if I survived in the jungle of Panama for a month, with nine guys, I may add, <laughs> you know, how can I bring my community and viewers into that experience? I'm excited about virtual reality. I'm excited about, you know, putting on a pair of glasses and if I'm giving you hard-hitting coverage of what's happening in Gaza, you know, to be able to take the community there so that you can also, in a way, experience it, which is not something, obviously, that we're able to do today. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's the interactivity and VR is a component of that. I think it's really being able to live with and coexist and bring the content um, in and around you and interact with it, whether it's a live event in virtual reality. I think as a media owner, um, we're becoming better at that, and I think most people in the media space are too. Definitely with media and entertainment becoming a lot more immersive where you're not just walking the watching the cooking show, you're cooking along okay. to now actually feeling like you're in the kitchen. Um, you know, whether it's the, the Apple goggles in the future that get so good and all that. Um, I also think there's a big opportunity with fan-driven franchises, meaning that the fans actually can have input on the creative and the storylines and the plot lines that get created in uh, mainstream media. And um, there's already been tests around this. I know Fox has tested this with uh, one of their animated series called Carpopolis. Um, where they actually allowed people to purchase, um, they tested this out actually with NFTs, um, that gave them the ability to have input over how certain characters lived or died and who killed them. And it was a great success in terms of, you know, allowing those people to have input and the level of engagement they got from those fans. But I think that's also a really interesting area where now we can be a part of the, actually shaping the media that, and the entertainment that we get to experience. All right, we're almost out of time here, so if anyone wants to talk about entertainment, learn more about what you're working on, how can they get in touch with you? Uh, I guess you find us on our corporate website at recurrent.io. Uh, easiest for me, I'd say just find me on good old-fashioned Instagram, at Mariana Atencio, and I'm also going to be here for the rest of the afternoon. So happy to connect with you guys in person as well. I'm at firesidechat.com. Check it out. Awesome. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, audience. Appreciate your time. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.